Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, we'll start with some quick introductions. Uh, I am Avi. I uh, am a creator on LinkedIn. I have a newsletter. Um, and I've been in the creator economy about 15 years. Highlights include being one of the first talent agents representing creators at WME, building the digital and audio team at Wheelhouse, and uh, most recently leading the creator partnerships team at Patreon. Uh, hi, I'm John Gibbs. I have spent uh, much of my career figuring out how to build an effective marketing and media mix. Uh, one of the areas that I focused on both at my role at Spotify as well as at L2 Research previously was taking a look at how influencers can fit better into a marketing mix. And now you can think of return on investment, ROI, and all those types of fun things when you think about this type of investment work. Hi, I'm Jeff Rubenstein. Um, might be a little different than some of you in that uh, I'm part of comms. I'm a Xbox comms director. I'm responsible for uh, our creator work and our editorial work. So reaching people that read and people that won't. So, Samantha Sechel, I lead um, social product and digital innovation for Live Nation. It's a very fun job, really great team. A lot of them are here today. <laughs> um, so have been in the social space for a while. First started, right, unifying 800 social handles over a decade ago with our audiences and now really leaning into the creator economy in all different ways, right? Selling tickets, matching brand partners to their consumer demographic, through the power of live, we have a live event somewhere in the world every 17 minutes. So there's a lot to play with, and it's it's really a fun space to be. Awesome. So you all have worked or do work in marketing in some way at the intersection of marketing, creators, and entertainment. Um, that looks very different depending on what you're selling or, or who you're working with. So I would love for each of you to talk about you know, what success looks like, maybe share an example of a successful campaign or way that you have worked with creators in the past. I'll, I'll take that first. Yeah, for it. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, we cover so much, right? Creators are influential themselves. Um, the live entertainment audience is 84% more influential um, to their peers than a non-live event goer. So our fans are influential. The performers are influential. Um, influencers want to attend our events, right? So there's so much to work with, uh, and, and we've done so many things. I think one example of something really successful we've done, a lot of you might not know this, is we actually have a creator house that we've launched. Um, we're entering our third year, and the creators for this house can help market everything we do, right? If there is a tour announce, or one of the tours from our management division is launching an album, they can stop by the house, and perform in the backyard. Um, the, the creators can attend the first date, right? And highlight how great this event is and then share that you too can attend the event. And then brands integrate into the house, into the lifestyle moments, right? So um, Coca-Cola is a partner of the break room or uh, GoPuff last year partnered and, and everyone GoPuffed uh, food and beverages to the house and they cooked with what they GoPuffed to the house. So there's really great opportunity to integrate into this house and it really helps us um, achieve whatever KPIs you might have. And everything that we do with a house or any creator is tied to what is it that the goal is. So if it's performance, we make sure to achieve the, the performance-based goal of the ticket sales. If it's awareness, we have that upper funnel approach. Um, thanks to Creator IQ, everything is measurable. And Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to the measurement in a moment. Uh, yeah. Jeff, you want to talk about Xbox? Yeah, well, as, as part of comp, sentiment is so important. And I think in games, and, and I'm sure there's applicable uh, versions of this for all of you, but uh, the viewers of these creators, they know very quickly if this person actually cares about this game or this system or something like that. And, uh, and so creating authentic fans for Xbox or some of our games, whether it's Minecraft or Halo or uh, Starfield or any of these things, it's so important to find the right people. And to ensure that like, even when we're not there, that when they're being asked uh, or in a position where people want to know what they think about it, that we've gotten to them first and given them a, a great opportunity to engage on their terms with whatever it is that we've got going on. So um, for instance, like uh, last week, uh, our marketing teams, we partner with marketing all the time. And uh, when we have these authentic creators that we know actually care about these things, when there's opportunities for plus ups or um, opportunities to, to place these, these folks, like sometimes it's the face of an ad campaign, we know someone who's going to you know, create those results that 
the marketing team is looking for, but also resonates naturally because they've been playing these games for a long time and their audience knows it and expects it and actually celebrates, hey, they've secured the bag, like they're part of this, this big thing. And uh, that, that's the type of thing we try to find these win-win uh, situations. So it sounds like you're building relationships with creators more organically and then you know, where it makes sense and where you have those strong relationships, you can then give them paid opportunities through the marketing budget. Exactly. So day in and day out, we're, um, again, functioning as part of comms, like earning coverage, if you will. But in doing so, we end up finding who's really uh, popping, who's really authentically into something. And then when we have the opportunity, we effectively become casting directors. And when we have plus ups, like we love to be able to, you know, elevate that based off of the fact that we know they're already resonating with the, the people we want to reach. Awesome. John, you, you're, you've been kind of on, a, on the other side of this. You actually measure success or have measured success for advertisers, for, for brands who are doing entertainment marketing, you know, most recently through Spotify. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we look at it in really sort of two different ways. One is what are the tools that we can give from a data perspective to creators to be able to produce better reads, to be able to produce more effective content that they put out in the world through the platforms that we work on. So you want to make sure that you want to be able to give sort of the insights, the tips and tricks, the analytics that are required to make sure that what the person is doing, how they're speaking, who they're speaking to, et cetera, is as effective as it can possibly be. And you try to do that through a variety of data driven, data -driven techniques, tagging a bunch of other things. The other side of that is that being able to prove out how does that actually work? Is it actually generating a positive return on investment? And there's a number of different scenarios, um, particularly at Spotify, where we were working with different types of creators to figure out how to most effectively roll up, say, the metrics from the work that they're doing with a specific advertiser into the advertiser's media mix model or to other types of marketing applications so the data could be looked at comparably relative to other types of marketing investments. That has its pluses and minuses, but we can talk more about that as we go. Well, let's, let's get into the how then. Um, we were talking about a, a bit about this last night, but you know, comparing creators... Uh, that are uh, marketing your products or marketing your uh, clients from across platforms, a bit like comparing apples and oranges. Um, can, can each of you kind of talk about what your approach is and why it's the best approach? Do you, do you want to start or do you want me to? You can start. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, number, the main trick, and I think everybody knows this, is really sort of two, two different pieces, right? One is that we're dealing with a bunch of different walled gardens that have a bunch of different individual metrics that can't be really cross-reported well across uh, different platforms and also can't be kind of deduplicated. So the amount of incrementality that Meta is showing you isn't necessarily the same as the amount of incrementality TikTok is showing you or something like that. So the ability to bring those two numbers together into one platform is extremely difficult to do and is a hard thing to dissect. So that's, that's part of the trick. The other trick is just simply being able to normalize the total user base and those types of things to know how many people across all those different types of platforms that you're actually talking to. And to do that, there's a bunch of different types of platforms that are on the market right now. But that first understanding that sort of critical reach element and then understanding that return on investment element is, uh, is important. How you get to that return on investment element can depend a lot on the campaign type and all these types of things. But most of the clients I've worked with have looked at incremental brand dollar lift as the, the key factor they want to go to. And some of the more upper level brand metrics are considered nice to haves in a lot of cases, but the hard dollars are what they're, what they're really shooting for. Right. So it's, it's, you're trying to get beyond the kind of vanity metrics of, oh, this campaign got this many views or this much engagement to get to what really matters, which is, hey, did we make money? Yeah, yeah. Try to get to try to get beyond that and try to get beyond the brand makes me feel better because they partnered with this person mm -hmm. uh, to try to get to the hard dollars that are, that are associated with that making feel good uh, uh, feeling that one derives. But I do think that the awareness goals are still important, right? But it's making sure you prove that that engagement is there. It's not just about impressions. And that's where a lot of what, what Jeff was saying is important, right? That authentic, organic connection to what it is that you're doing, right? So if it's connecting a brand with an event, for example, right? We have a lot of festivals, Governor's Ball Music Festival. Um, a lot of brands had on the ground activations at our festival. And which creators in our network of thousands of creators, like the artists performing, have raised their hand to say, you know, the headliners, the, the you know, tertiary, everyone on that lineup, is important to us and the brand, the category that you're associating with also makes sense. 
Uh, and that's when the engagement increases, right? Because it makes sense in their feed. And there's nothing wrong with awareness as a KPI. And, and it's an important, right? You need to let people know what's happening. The interest comes, I think everyone in this room knows that. And then the purchase follows once you know what it is you're buying. So everything has to work in lockstep. So you have that awareness. And then you can start doing that lower funnel, driving the purchase intent. And there's many ways to do that. There's many ways to track it directly, indirectly. Uh, but you have to know what that goal is going into it and make sure you're achieving it through those authentic connections. In what I think is continuing the theme of me being over here on the left, uh, with, <laughs> as we found in when we provide like the right opportunity or exclusive with a creator, thinking very much almost in like a traditional comms mindset of giving someone something of like a king-making opportunity. And the example that I'll think of is um, when we revealed our Xbox Series X uh, for the very first time to the world, it actually was with a creator. And we brought them into Microsoft. We introduced them to the engineers. Um, they got to see like all these, like, like I'm not allowed in this building unless I was bringing this person with me. And they put together this amazing uh, video like based on that opportunity, which ended up getting uh, 16, 17 million views like organic on YouTube, that ended up becoming the source for traditional media, for other creators for six months until we were ready to actually ship this thing. And so by just creating like a, an unmissable opportunity for them, it again was a, another win-win situation that, that really worked for us. And then our other teams were able to build off of that to, um, sort of just direct where we can, uh, you know, you know, carry that momentum and lead into things like pre-orders and stuff like that. Well, let's talk a bit of, uh, then about some tactical learnings, right? Because you all, you know, market uh, or have worked with a variety of properties. Um, you uh, market through creators across a variety of platforms. Um, I would love to, to kind of understand, like, what have you learned uh, that might be valuable for folks in the audience who are either doing creator-based marketing or are, you know, working or are creators themselves or are working with creators to try to maximize the value of these campaigns for both parties? One thing my team and I were talking about yesterday um, was test everything, right? You might see a piece of content that might not resonate with what you're doing, but let the numbers show you what works. Don't go off of assumptions. These creators, right, they're their own media entities in their own right, and they know what works on their platforms. So, for example, we did this huge venue ambassador program. We had, you know, 30 venues and 80 creators across 200 concerts this summer, and we couldn't possibly moderate the way we thought was necessary, and we leaned on the creators to know what worked. And this one piece of content that performed the best, I think in, it had 8 million, I could be wrong, organic views just in this one piece of TikTok post, it was just this fisheye view of, you know, of, this venue is great, right? You would never have thought that's all it takes, but it worked with, with her followers. So test everything. If we saw that, we were just saying yesterday, we probably would have said, can you, can you do something that has a little, you know, it, it had the right information in there, but could you do something a little with more flair? And, and, and it worked, right? So just lean on the reason you're working with them because they know how to connect with their followers. I, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, we had a recent example. We shipped uh, our most recent version of our racing simulator called Forza Motorsport. That's a team that like wants to make sure every rivet in the car, I, I think cars have rivets, like is in exactly the right place. And they're very like, this is what this is. And so the creators we worked with, they wanted people who really understood cars and really like were kind of like straightforward. This game has 500 cars and 20 tracks and the tires are, you know, whatever tires are supposed to be. And uh, our, our biggest win that I think came out of this is convincing them, we'll do all that but we really want to work with this one TikToker named Mr. Car Sounds who basically blows into like a paper towel roll and sounds exactly like a car. <laughs> and you have to see it or hear it to believe it. It's really exceptionally... <laughs> and that ended up blowing up and doing so well. And it was like, we can have fun with this too. And because, you know, the straightforward stuff that works with traditional media and with certain elements of, of creators and social, but... We need to have fun. We're a gaming company, and let's let them do that. And everyone was very happy that we did it, but it, you know, to convince other folks to do that took a little bit of a, I don't know, uh, out on a ledge. What, what then? Sorry, b b before we uh, uh, get to to your learnings, I'm just curious. You know, both of you kind of agreed that you got to let the creators run with the creative, but then what role does marketing have? as drivers of the creative, right? Historically, marketing has been a creative function. 
Yeah, I, I, so much of it is like sort of setting the parameters and understanding and working with those creators. Like, what is the element of all the different key messages and reasons to believe of this particular, I, like, actually resonates with you? And in this case, the team was exceptionally proud of the fact that the audio is so authentic, like, that someone who knows cars can, like, close their eyes and know that that is an Acura, you know, I'm really painting myself into a corner here. I drive an electric car. It doesn't make any noise, you know? But so, and, and so when we found that and he got to hit those points in a good way while also having fun and sounding exactly like a car, like that was what worked for them. And so really just like not trying to have a, a, an individual creator try to land everything because that is just not going to work. Right. It's yeah. knowing what the requirements are, right? So the requirements are, keep that KPI in mind. It's sell tickets or make you know them aware of this summer campaign, this new release. And the key, this is the key word of the release. This is the link that you have to drive to. Make sure those are the must-haves, right? And then there's the nice-to-haves. And we do really fantastic briefs. We walk through, right? It's one thing to email a brief to a creator. And it's another, and it, it takes time to get on the phone and review it with them step-by-step. And then they ask the questions. So the nice to have, you know, are those required? No, no, we really mean it. Just make sure you get the link in there however you think necessary. But review it. Take the time to think through it. Does this make sense? Is this logical? Those briefs are a really important step. And when you think through it, it makes it more clear for them. Can I ask a question to both of you? At, yeah. I, I, want, just, want to jump in on that? Well, yeah, ask the question. Plus, I want to I, I, I'm just curious, like, how often, like, how many revs do you build into, like, a, like a contract with a creator? Like, going back and forth because, you know, I, I'm just really curious. For approvals or for? For approvals, like, you know, because sometimes that when you're working with a new creator, like the first take, like, misses. Yeah. So one thing that typically we're at events, so we always send a team member on site the first time we're working with someone, and that way you can kind of see in real time, oh, that's not right, that's not right. So you try and have make that rapport, have this great relationship. It's a very relationship-based, um, you know, industry. And then you know what you're going to get. We try not to do more than two rounds of edits. Listen, brands in the room and creators in the room, not more than two rounds of edits on either side, right? Um, and that typically works. We, we don't typically go beyond that. Sorry, John. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so to, to, reinforce, uh, to reinforce the earlier point on familiarity, mm -hmm. we ran studies over about maybe about 7,000 or 8,000 podcast reads and also took a look at basically the familiar, familiarity of the hosts uh, with the products and the effectiveness of the ads themselves. And there was a direct correlation between the familiarity of the host and how well the ad worked mm -hmm. and how well the read worked. So everything that you're talking about in terms of the preparedness is super, super, super critical and plays out. The other thing that we found was sort of the depth of the relationship. The length of the relationship was super, super important mm -hmm. in terms of being able to drive long-term effectiveness. But the host not necessarily going back or the, uh, the, the creator not necessarily going back every single time to the same partner, being able to kind of rotate through to give themselves more legitimacy was an important part of also what we saw in an effective relationship or effective reads. So, so you're saying, you know, the old adage that, you know, uh, authenticity, right? Like the creator authentically likes the product, like the data bears that out. The data definitely bears that out. I mean, there, there's, I think, been a long time argument between whether or not you want to have sort of, quote, scaled content, scaled ads versus sort of uh, creator-generated content. And it seems very clear that creator-generated content works better. Uh, whether or not from a cost, from a cost standpoint, it, it evens out is unclear, but definitely from, a, um, uh, from an efficacy standpoint, it definitely works better. Yeah, and even when you turn, now there's a lot of partners that can turn the creator content into that ad unit and those are performing really well when you yep. when you turn that actual content into the banner so i want to go back to that so you're saying you're saying that the data bears out that creator uh creator marketing is actually more effective than paid media search and social yes. and, and 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 that yes y y depend okay, okay, okay. Qual depend qualify that Qual but, yeah, but yeah, yeah when executed well yes okay uh can you just dig in on that a little bit i'm curious like uh, do you have any stats or metrics off the top of your head? I mean, there's, 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 a, bunch, the there's a bunch of different like 6X and 10X and, and stats that are floating out there right now. I think that being able to have like a real number from an incrementality standpoint probably is not, a, there wouldn't be a true number right now. Right. But we were typically seeing when we were seeing like a, let's say a, a, um, a creator read piece of ad copy versus a, just a standard ad copy read is we'd normally see like a 15 to 20% higher brand lift. 
Okay. Um, and that, you know, we're talking off smaller numbers, so it could be a lot. But you would generally particularly see on the brand, affili the brand affiliation side, the brand intent side, pretty high, uh, much higher lift than you would see sort of typically on a, um, you know, a generic ad. Our ROAS, we're seeing directly that the ROAS for creator-led content versus just standard paid social is double. You're saying double. You're saying double. At least double. Consistently across the board. We just ran a really great campaign. Willie Nelson and Live Nation announces on the road again, right? We're helping to... Um, provide funding to smaller bands and our smaller venues. And we did, just, just two weeks ago, we did a campaign where creators shared the content and we just boosted from our own handles. And we shifted entirely to the creative-driven content because on, what, on, on the performance we were seeing. Every every uh, creator and influencer marketer here should write that stat down. Go back to whoever manages their budget and say, hey, can we shift some from Double paid the row over? Ass. Double. Double the ROAS. <laughs> we just had a situation last week. Situation makes it sound bad. It was it was fun. Opportunity. Uh, opportunity. There we go. <laughs> right? Are you sure you're not in comms? But uh, so we uh, ended up relaunching our Power Your Dreams campaign, and we wanted to do it in a big way. And so the marketing team got the Las Vegas Sphere. They did the first 3D. Um, it was very creepy. People thought it was fake because it was it looked too real. And uh, and they asked like, like, well, how do we get creators to care about this? Because you know, getting the sphere is great, but if nobody sees it or or just people in their hotel exactly. room you know will it actually end up blowing up so yeah. we we got them to change the timing to twitchcon which is uh twitch is a the biggest live streaming gaming um uh platform out there and they have their annual conference it brings in uh, at least 50,000 creators there so we got them to move it to that and then what we did is we held a mixer leading into it where we met up with people that we typically uh, like to engage with. And we um, then moved them over to uh, the High Roller, which is like the London Eye, but Vegas style. I mean, you know, they have a Statue of Liberty and a, uh, an Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. Why not have a, a London Eye? So we, as they hit the top of the wheel, it flipped over for the first time to the Xbox sphere and it did, you know, what it did. And there were literally screams. Like people were like, <laughs> like a... Delight, not yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, terror. <laughs> some people, not the eye of Sarah. Some, I mean, you know, it's it's really high up, but uh, but like combining those efforts and and as well as those things reached, it was creators taking cell phone photos mm -hmm. and or amplifying those of people who were that actually traveled the furthest, and then created again a lot of media pickup across that the fact that we did that, mm -hmm. and uh, and so like those two working in concert really worked out well for us. Cool. We've got about two and a half minutes left. So I want to end with kind of talking about what are some of the challenges uh, of working with creators and, and how do you how do you address them? How do you overcome them? I'll just go real fast. We work with a lot of like children, effectively. I mean, not they're over 18, but mentally. Um, and you know, we're living in a crazy world. So someone who is like uh, amazing to work with um, or may have a huge following just can't shut their mouth and or literally incites a riot or I mean like I could like go on forever and so th th we constantly have to be vigilant and because someone who was great to work with six months ago might be just like not brand safe in the slightest like the next day and that's what our team spends so much time doing is like uh did you hear about this and uh and really quickly you turning yeah I think um we have this interesting balance between license content, right? Like licensing music content. Sometimes our relationships with the artists, because we manage the artists, we do the tours, we're ahead of the relationship that the song has with the platforms. And that is an interesting place for us to sit because we have the rights, we have the written legal approvals, but the platform isn't aware of it. And then the content gets taken down because the platform didn't see our contract, right? So that's an interesting area where I think there's room to grow and attend. interesting it's very charitable yes exactly um so you know and then the creators they put all this effort in we know everything's above board and here you are having to figure out those nuances um so that's certainly a fun one and then of course yes right like these are people who are larger than life they're they're younger they have this you know they're experiencing celebrity for their first time in the open especially at our music festivals and how do you deal with that right you know we provide security we make sure that um that level of comfort is there for the producer of the event and the creator, but it, but it's balancing and it's new to everybody because they're not the performing talent, but sometimes they're more recognizable than the performing talent unless it's the headliner. So we're navigating all of this in real time for the first time. 
Yeah, I think I think my the, the two for me would be one the challenge with getting um, creators to increase the ad load in the shows. Uh, always want more ads. Uh, and two, uh, brand safety uh, for the associated reads with with creator copy. When you're working with a much longer tail of of uh, creators, having managing brand safety on uh, mo across multiple platforms is super hard to do, and it's been a it's been a challenge. Awesome. Well, thank you all for doing this. Thank you all for coming. This has been great. Thank you.